kindergarten, and uh, his mom was a little bit worried about, you know, whether or not he'd make it to school or not, so she, for the first couple of days, walked with him until after the second day, he came home and he said to his mom, Mom, look, I want to be like the other boys. I want, I want to walk to school by myself. You're making me look bad. <laughs> so, Mom, she went to plan B. She decided that, well, all right, well, let Timmy, Timmy and his friend walk, walk to school together. But she connected with Mrs. Goodness next door and asked if she would kind of wait until they got started and would follow at a distance just to make sure that Timmy and his friend got to school all right with no, no troubles. So Mrs. Goodnest promised that she would do that. So for the next uh, two or three days, uh, Timmy and his friend walked to school, but they noticed in a distance behind them this lady following. So the friend of Timmy says to him, Timmy, do you see that woman walking behind us? She's been doing it for the last couple of days. Do you know her? Timmy looked at him and he said, yeah, not to worry about her. That's Mrs. Goodnest, my neighbor. And he says, oh, so you know her, you know her well? Yeah, she's okay, she's okay. He says, uh, it's something we have to get used to. She says, every night when I go to do my prayers, mom gets me to read the 23rd Psalm. And he says, and it says this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. <laughs> he says, so we have to get used to it. <laughs> well, that's kind of like what this passage of Scripture is for us as we look at this uh, next fruit of the Spirit, God's fruit of, of goodness. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Now, I know I'm good. I know I'm good because my brothers and sisters at, when I was growing up would always come into the room, my older ones, and they would say to me, oh, look, at there's little goody-goody. <laughs> so I know I was good, you know, mama's little goody. And uh, so, you know, this fruit of goodness, I know that I, you know, I definitely got this one. Um, but I think as I've gone through the course of my uh, growing up and my life in ministry, uh, that we really don't look at goodness the way we ought to really look at goodness. Now, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and we know them all off by heart thus far, don't we? So if I asked you to start naming them, you'd be able to go right from, if you were smart, you'd look at the bulletin cover. <laughs> um, it, they're all there. So we've looked at love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and now we're looking at this fruit called goodness. It's an action fruit, or it's an action quality. Uh, how many remember t t the, the, ted, uh, the bear Teddy Ruxpin? I mean, it's going back when I was, oh, thank goodness. You guys are a lot younger than me, and you still know that? Yeah, well, we got one for, uh, I guess, Melissa at the time. Teddy Ruxpin, he was a little bear, and he came uh, with batteries, and he talked, and it says, do good deeds, good deeds belong to you, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that's all we heard for the longest while until I took the batteries out. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like Chatty Cathy, you get annoyed of it after a while. Um, but yeah, he would do that, do good deeds, because that's what goodness is. Goodness is an action word. And, and so we look at that this morning. Why should goodness be so important for us to nurture and to pursue in our Christian walk? Why is it so important for us to be good? Well, I hope as we go through these points this morning and we look at this funny passage of Scripture to talk about what goodness is, we'll see the importance of it and we'll be able to hopefully uh, strive to acquire it within our our walk as Christian men and women. Which brings me to my first point that I want us to look at this morning. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. And how did I get to that point? I did it by, by this way. When we talk about goodness, we talk about different things. We apply different things for the word goodness, like kindness, has many other words that can be associated with it. Uh, 
The word love, if we experience the love, the fruit of love in our lives, this should be a natural outpouring for us. We love our children. We love apple pie, right? We, we love beautiful sunsets. But each of these words describing love are entirely different. And it's the same thing when we apply to the word good. We say, I had a good breakfast this morning. How many had a good breakfast this morning? How many didn't eat? Okay. You're like me. We'll be growling through this service. Or, I met a really good person. Or, I had a good cry the other day. Um, they're all different. They, they mean different things when we look at the word good. But when we read the opening chapters of Genesis in this great book that God gave to us, inspired writers to write for us, we know that God created the heavens and the earth then he creates life in the sea and in the air and on the ground. And after each thing that he created, God said what? I'm a little slow of hearing in this side. You've got to speak a little louder. God said what? Thank you. You can talk. It is good. And then God created the epitome of it all. He created man and woman. And he said what? It was very good. God was pleased. Well, what does that mean? God said it was good. Simply that. God said it pleased him. So, if I looked at that and I took it a step for, further, I could say that goodness, as it relates to humanity, is a good person who is pleasing to God. A good person is a person pleasing to God. And we please God, according to Scripture, when we are obedient to His commands and wills. God says, be holy as I am holy. So God is good right that's what psalm psalm 100 verse 5 says god is good his love endures forever but question that quickly came to mind for me when i looked at that passage of scripture was well what makes god good <laughs> what makes god good his characteristic his attributes all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, holy, just, merciful. These are the descriptions. These are the attributes. These are the characters of God which make God good. He is forgiving. He is generous. Therefore, if we who follow God, who are in a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, and follow God, if we are in a relationship with Him, then we too are called to be as much as is humanly possible to be like Him. To be just, to be pure, to be holy, to be forgiving, for when we are, then he says he's pleased with us, and that is good. That is good. That's what makes us good. Now tell me, does this ever happen to you? You're in a conversation with people. You're meeting them. Like we'll, like we'll experience when we leave here this morning after this service. They'll come, people will come out, and they'll say, okay, Major, Great day, great time being with you this morning. Now, be good. <laughs> and I just don't get it. Like, why would they need to say, be good to me? Because <laughs> my mother said, my brother said, you're Mr. Goody Goody. No. 
They say goodbye, and then they add, now be good. And I respond, hey, people, look at me. In my profession, I have to be good, right? I can't be anything else. You expect me to be good because I am your pastor. After all, everybody knows that preachers are paid to be good, at least on this day. (laughs) <laughs> right? You are, therefore, I look at that statement when you come out with it, and I say this. Now, listen carefully, and don't twinge. You say, be good to me, and I have to be because I'm your pastor. Does that then say that you are all good for nothing? Because <laughs> I, I get paid to be good. <laughs> No, joking aside, I suppose we could do the right thing for the wrong reasons. I know sometimes we get caught up in doing the right things for the wrong reasons. But goodness, according to Scripture, is doing the right thing for the right reason. It is a pretty simple definition, I believe, and if we think about it long enough, hopefully we'll begin to see the value that goodness is as we walk the Christian way. Doing good is something God wants us to do. In Colossians 1 verse 10, Paul said, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all aspects bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in your knowledge of God. God expects that of us if we are in a relationship with him. He expects us to be good. And like some of the other fruits that we've already talked about, where do we turn to see a demonstration of what it is to be good? We look at passage of scripture like what Robin read to us a few minutes ago. So look at Luke chapter 4, turn in your Bibles there to Luke chapter 4 verses 1 to 13 and let's look at this passage of scripture that talks about the temptation of Christ and figure out how on earth does this relate to being good? How on earth does this relate to being good? We have been reminded over and over and over again that Jesus Christ is our example. When we want perfect love, we look at Jesus. When we want perfect joy, we look at Jesus. When we want perfect peace, we look at Jesus. The same is true in the aspect of this virtue called goodness. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that being good came naturally to Jesus. I used to think that way because Jesus was the perfect Son of God. Jesus was truly God, truly man, and in his humanity, because of the association, the fact that he was truly God also, we never really think hard about the fact, well, was this a problem for Jesus, being good? And so I thought about it a little bit more through the course of uh, my officership and studying, and I came across the idea that, you know, we have to be careful to not be so naive to think that being good came naturally to Jesus in his state of being human. You see, he lived in the flesh just like you and I live in the flesh. And we see, according to this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 4, that, G, uh, that Satan came and tempted him over and over again. Well, at least three times here. And as the end of the, chap- or end of the verses say, uh, other times as well. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, to the... To, uh, to the people that he was talking with at the time, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? He says, no one is good except God. 
No one is good except God. So let's look at this passage of Scripture and the temptations that Satan came and threw at Jesus. You see, the first temptation dealt with selfishness. The second temptation dealt with compromise. And the third temptation dealt with popularity. Selfishness leads to compromise, which leads to the result of popular. We compromise because we're yielding to popularity. And we compromise and go to the ways of popularity because we're selfish initially. We look to ourselves. So let's look at these three temptations and see how goodness is depicted. Luke 4, verses 3 and 4 says, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, I've had some bread that's just as hard as stone. Uh, I remember my first trip to Lewisburg, Nova Scotia, and uh, after we got past the, sec uh, well, the security guard, after we got past the guard at the, the front entrance, um, and that was only because we snuck behind the people ahead of us uh, who spoke French. Um, we got in there, and they were handing out this fresh break bread, be, bread, and I had it, and it sat on my stomach all day long like stone. It was pretty heavy stuff. So we know the devil throws this at him. If you're the son of God, take this stone and say, turn it into bread. And what does Jesus say to him? It is written. Important. It is written. Man does not live on bread alone. Now here's this age-old struggle between selfishness and love. It started in the Garden of Eden and it continues right to this very day. Today's culture tells us that as long as we have food and nice clothing, as long as we live in a nice home and have a good automobile, you know that Honda Accord that we all should be driving as Christians. Um, as long as we're able to live in comfort, then we are a success. And we ought to be proud of ourselves and think, hey, this is good. This is good. But here's the devil trying to get Jesus to focus on himself. He tempts Jesus to turn the stones into bread now, you've got to understand that Satan always tempts us in areas of our weakness. And Jesus had been fasting for 40 days prior to this. He was extremely hungry. Not like John and I yesterday who worked for a few moments and, and got hungry. Waiting for them to, to say dinner was ready. But there it is, 40 days Without eating, you're going to be pretty hungry. And it would have been so easy for Jesus in his humanity because he was also God to have used his power, his godly power to do what Satan challenged him to do. Now, do you get what Satan was trying to do to Jesus? Do you get it? If he could just get Jesus to be concerned about satisfying his own physical needs of making things easy for himself, of taking the easy way out, then Jesus would never be willing to pray this prayer in Matthew 26, 39, which says, Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. And he certainly would not have been willing to pay the price for your sin or mine. He would never have gone to the cross for us if he had surrendered to this request by Satan in the area of selfishness. He would never have gotten around to being concerned about who we are. But Jesus because he had come to do the will of his Father, knew that the most important thing was not himself, but us. 
And he said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. You see, Jesus did the right thing for the right reason. Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father, and that pleased the Father. And when we please the Father, it is good. It is good. Well, let's look at the second temptation, verses 5 to 7, compromise. The devil led him up to a high place, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, Jesus, all this will be yours. Here it is. Here it is, Jesus, Satan says. I have control over the people of this world. They're serving me, so let's make a deal. Don't set your standards so high. Just compromise with me, and all this can be yours. You see, we sometimes in the church, as fellowship of believers, sometimes have set the standard so high that it's always a challenge for us to reach them. And so we're saying, well, maybe if we loosen up a bit, maybe if we slacken off a bit, we'll be able to fill these places. We'll get more people attending. Maybe if we just make the little compromises and all this will happen. Someone in this community was hired to do a new job. And uh, they were accepted for it. But when they got into the position, they found out that there was, there was going to be a conflict of interest. And so right away, they, they took the high road and said, I'm sorry, but this is a conflict because I've been working here and this is an offshoot of where I was working before and it really becomes a conflict for me. Therefore, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to step away from this job offer. And they did. They would not compromise their principles. Sometimes I wonder, or I ask myself, how often does Satan use this temptation on us as Christian men and women? Are we playing fast and loose with the truth, cutting corners, compromising with that which you know to be wrong and yet willing to make that compromise? All this just so that you can get more and more and look good. Jesus responds to Satan saying, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. So Jesus did the right thing for the right reason, according to 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Selfishness, when our focus is off, when our focus is on us, leads to compromise, which leads which is another way of saying we're willing to drop the standards, we're, we're living to go the, the, the freer way, which then leads to the road of popularity and leaves us thinking that, hey, this is good. We're good. Verses 9 to 11, the, the devil leads Jesus to Jerusalem, hands has him stand on the highest point of the temple and says to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against any stone. Satan takes Scripture completely out of context here, and he does it really well. 
You see, he's tempting Jesus to do something spectacular to amaze the crowds and show them his power. Why bother spending three and a half years walking back and forth through the land accompanied by just a few Galileans as his disciples? If Jesus would do something spectacular like throwing himself down from the top of this temple in Jerusalem before the leaders of Israel and then, gave, then have God's angels swoop down and catch him like angels in the outfield, everyone would eagerly follow him. Wouldn't you? If you saw something miraculous like that happening? Then if he would do it again, every once in a while, people would come from far and near to see it and they would worship. He would instantly become the most popular man in all Israel. It would be so easy for Jesus to do this. And then the people would follow him everywhere, anywhere. That was the temptation that Satan brought to him. And it wasn't the last time. He did it again as Jesus hung on the cross. Listen to what it says in Matthew 27, verses 40 to 42. Jesus if you're really the Messiah, <coughs> come down from the cross and save yourself. Then we'll believe in you. Show us that you're really the Son of God and we will follow you. What a temptation these must have been for Jesus. You see, Jesus could have done it. He could have responded to all three. But in saving himself, he would not have been able to save us. Jesus therefore said to Satan in verse 12, Don't put the Lord your God to a test. And verse 13 says, When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until another appropriate time you see the devil doesn't stay away very long does he the adage has always been out there the closer you are to God the stronger the devil will fight don't ever think that it was easy for Jesus to be good for in his humanity, he was just like you and I. He had to deliberately do the right things for the right reasons. And we who call ourselves Christian, likewise, have to deliberately do the right things for the right reasons. We've read articles over and over again about churches and how some of the churches are constantly being tempted to focus more on the spectacular uh, side of service because they want to be popular. But the right thing for us to do in any service is to focus on Jesus, our example. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus was our example for goodness. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's up for, to you and I to let our light shine. It's up for you and I to display the goodness of this fruit. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about a good tree and a bad tree. He says in Matthew 7, 17 to 20, toward the end of the discourse, good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. The good trees can't produce bad fruit, and the bad tree can't produce good fruit. If the good tree does not produce good fruit, we cut it down, we throw it into the fire, buy their fruits you will recognize them. And that's what Jesus says to you and I as Christian men and women in this world we live in. 
we too will recognize, be able to recognize who is with Christ and who is against Christ. Just as the non-believer will be able to recognize in our walk whether or not we bear these fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. So the question is, what kind of fruit are we producing? And as we look at the fruit, do we see goodness? Is it there? Let me give you four aspects to what I believe goodness speaks to. First of all, Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, it says this. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now these are tough words. These are tough sayings. If I'm not able to forgive someone who sins against me, then God's not going to forgive me. Wow. So where are we in the act of demonstrating, displaying goodness in the area of forgiveness? If I go around holding grudges, then I won't receive the forgiveness of God because it's blocked by my unforgiving spirit. So the first step is to do the right thing for the right reason, is to become forgiving as God himself is. The second thing that leads to goodness, I believe, is purity. We can display goodness by being morally pure. Not, now that's completely countercultural for you and I. Because our world embraces impurity, we're seeing it air its ugly head again and again. Like for things that are happening in this world, we thought were finished long ago. They're airing their ugly heads again. Racism. Cars driving into crowded people. To show their supremacy. Man. Marital unfaithfulness is okay as long as no one gets hurt. Men have sexual flings and it's okay. Women have sexual flings and it's okay. You have to expect these things today. And yet when I pick up this book and I read through it, it's completely contrary to that cultural thinking. If you're going to be a good person, you have to be a pure, holy person, keeping your life pure before the Lord. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the re renewing of your mind as you look within these pages, as you pray daily. Then you will be able to test and prove what is the right thing to do for the right reason. Be holy as I am holy. Another aspect is graciousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. And why are we new? We're new because of the change that comes through our relationship with what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. We are not good for God. We are good because of God. And what God has done for us through this act of grace. What's the song say to us? He giveth and giveth 
and give us a gain. So if we are to participate in the goodness of God, we need to become generous. Someone has said, you never look more like God than when you are giving. Don't give out, out of guilt. Don't give out of obligation. Give because it's the right thing to do. And giving is in time. Giving is in who we are. Giving in study. It's not just the treasure. So, my friends, after having said all that about goodness, let me close with this statement. Goodness will never get us into heaven. We will never be good enough to get into heaven. It is only through the mercy and grace of God that we can be saved. So this morning, we ask ourselves again, are you good? Are you good as Scripture depicts goodness? True goodness is found in Christ. Is that your desire? The worship team is going to come and lead us in this worship song. This is my desire to honor you with all that I am, all that he is, to lay it before him and give him the glory, give him the worship. True goodness is found in Christ Jesus. I give you the opportunity to think about that. And if you're not in a relationship with him, I give you the opportunity to step out in faith and to trust his goodness to accompany you here and to change your life if you're open to having your life changed to be like he is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. Go from this place this morning and be good because when you are, it pleases the Father. <laughs>